Welcome to the day five of the fragmentation training school. Today we will have a lesson about benchmark theory from Professor Mikhail Kozubek of Masaryk University. We will see Bioflows, a benchmark platform explained by Sebastian Tosi, head of bioimage analysis facility, the Danish bioimaging infrastructure, Volker Becker, image analyst and developer at Montpellier Biocampus, and Benjamin Pavi from Vibcore facility in Leuven. Thank you. I please ask Professor Kozubek to share the screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure for me uh, to participate in this uh, training school of Neubier's Academy. So thanks uh, for the invitation. And uh, I will start talking uh, more theoretically and the colleagues will then continue in more practical way. So uh, I will introduce uh, some theory, uh, theoretical backgrounds about metrics and benchmarking uh, related to bioimage analysis. Uh, so uh, I'm from uh, Masaryk University, as uh, it was mentioned, and I am heading a unit that is called Center for Biomedical Image Analysis. So first of all, I would like to uh, talk about motivation. So why do we do benchmarking? And then uh, I will talk about the design of a benchmark or, or a challenge. So challenge is uh, another name for a competition uh, in this uh, biomedical imaging or bio uh, imaging field. Uh, so Challenge is actually also a benchmark, uh, but with uh, some uh, sort of competition uh, in the community. And uh, in this respect, I will talk about uh, data, data set selection, and about evaluation of algorithms, so about metrics. And then I will somehow summarize. So uh, let's start with uh, benchmarking. Uh, why do we do benchmarking? Uh, because historically, the tendency was to use very simple methods and uh, it was not uh, possible to compare uh, methods to each other and uh, any reasonable solution was uh, applied uh, for a long time. And uh, then in, uh, at, at the end of the last century, uh, people started thinking about uh, comparing uh, methods uh, to each other and uh, realized the lack of standards, but it was very difficult because there was no internet, uh, so there were only some FTP uh, sites with some uh, sets of standardized images, but uh, there was no correct answer uh, that uh, later on was called ground truth. So only after the introduction of uh, internet and web, uh, we had some uh, standardized uh, data sets uh, along with correct answer that we call ground truth. And uh, such annotated uh, images uh, became the basis of uh, proper objective uh, benchmarking. Uh, in biomedical imaging, the first uh, benchmark was a registration benchmark, uh, and it was in 1990s uh, organized uh, at uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, at the beginning of the century, medical imaging community started to do uh, produce benchmarks and competitions called challenges. And uh, approximately one decade later, a bioimaging community also started to produce such benchmarks and uh, challenges. Uh, and uh, it also became uh, sort of uh, politically supported uh, by different organizations and uh, different uh, bodies. Uh, so uh, there was a really um, hunger for standardized protocols, uh, quality uh, control, validated uh, tools, uh, and so on. And uh, then uh, this uh, different competitions called changes started to appear, and especially they were associated with two most important conferences in biomedical imaging community, and that was MICAI and ISBI. Uh, and if we uh, look at just bioimage analysis challenges, uh, it was uh, mainly at uh, ISBI. Uh, 
Concerning the task, the most uh, common task that uh, people had to solve while competing in the, in the challenge uh, or while uh, producing or using the benchmark uh, was the segmentation task. So segmentation was uh, the most common task uh, tackled by the community. And on the second place, uh, the classification task uh, and on the third place, detection task. And then tracking and some others. Uh, concerning modalities in general in biomedical imaging, the first place was magnetic resonance uh, and concerning bioimaging, so microscopy modality uh, that was on the fourth place. Um, so that was a bit of uh, history and motivation. And now let's uh, switch to uh, the design of the benchmark itself. Um, <clears throat> So the first part uh, of the design uh, is the data, data set selection. Uh, here we need to take care about the representativeness of the data. Uh, so cover variability of imaged objects. Then we should decide on using real or synthetic data or both. Uh, we should uh, annotate the data and uh, we should split the data into training and test data. So training data are used for training our methods and test data are used for uh, testing the performance. Sometimes test data are hidden to uh, participants of the competitions and uh, only codes are, are submitted and then they are evaluated on test data by the organizers of the challenge. Algorithm evaluation uh, is usually done by computing one or more metrics. Uh, and these metrics actually are measures that measure the performance of uh, the tasks of classification, segmentation, or whatever. And if we compute multiple metrics, then we have to merge them somehow and create uh, rankings uh, based on those uh, metrics. And uh, finally, it's ideal if uh, the benchmark or challenge is uh, uh, kept for uh, future uses, uh, it's uh, somehow maintained or even updated and it's possible to submit uh, new methods uh, afterwards. So uh, if I now uh, speak more closely about these individual aspects, so uh, concerning the representativeness of the, of the data, we need to cover the variability of uh, sizes, shapes, textures, densities, or speeds of objects in time-lapse. Uh, then we should cover uh, various events. So if we uh, are interested in uh, mitotic uh, events or apoptotic events, uh, we should have enough of those in the data in time-lapse imaging. Uh, we should also uh, cover the artifacts. So uh, we should not present uh, benchmarks uh, we should not present participants with data uh, that are clean and dust-free and uh, noise-free, but we should present the data as is usual in uh, normal uh, acquisition conditions, so including uh, those artifacts, because we need methods that uh, can cope with these artifacts and with a certain level of noise uh, and, and uh, <coughs> um, blur, etc. Then uh, we should uh, keep uh, the natural proportions of uh, different uh, objects and uh, phenomena. Uh, and uh, then uh, we should uh, think uh, about uh, rare cases. So only if we have some very rare events, uh, then uh, we uh, should uh, somehow uh, improve the frequency of occurrence of these events, uh, otherwise the methods will not work uh, uh, well for, for real e event or real type of objects. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, data sets or benchmarks already exist for certain applications, uh, so it's uh, of course uh, worth uh, having some uh, look at uh, existing uh, benchmarks. And only if uh, they are not uh, comprehensive enough or something uh, is insufficient, the task we uh, need to solve is different, then it is uh, worth releasing additional benchmarks or data sets. 
Um, so there, there are quite a lot of benchmarks already around and a lot of uh, benchmark data sets. So uh, it is worth having a look at, at those. Now the next aspect is real versus synthetic data. Of course, both types have uh, advantages and disadvantages. So the advantage of real data is that they represent the real life, uh, best of all, while synthetic data uh, can uh, uh, have uh, some other um, uh, uh, have some other um, properties, uh, not necessarily the same um, statistical properties, for example, as the real data. But on the other hand, uh, high quality synthetic data generators can uh, simulate quite good training data uh, to develop methods. And the advantage of synthetic data is that the ground truth is known precisely um, and inherently, while for real data, we need uh, annotators and we need to annotate uh, those data. Uh, typically, the synthetic data for bioimaging are generated in several phases. Uh, first, some digital phantom is created. Uh, then uh, the microscopy uh, process is simulated, so some blur is introduced, and then the detection is simulated by the camera or EMT or whatever, and uh, some noise is introduced. Alternatively, nowadays, we can use also so-called GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, to produce uh, similar uh, images or to, to use or augmentation uh, for, for real data sets. We can also produce uh, time-lapse uh, synthetic uh, sequences just by generating one uh, frame after another uh, using uh, some moving, moving digital phantom. Now let's uh, switch to annotations. So uh, synthetic data are not, uh, uh, or we, do, we do not need to annotate synthetic data, but we need to annotate real, real data. And uh, usually it is done so that we ask several experts because uh, one expert uh, is not enough uh, due to some level of uncertainty. Uh, so each expert produces slightly different result. So it's best to uh, hire at least three experts and uh, produce three annotations and then use, uh, uh, for example, majority voting. Uh, so uh, if two experts agree there is a cell uh, in certain place, in certain time point, then we say in the final ground truth that there is a cell. And if, for example, two experts think that there is a division uh, at a particular time point, then in the final ground truth there will be division. Uh, sometimes uh, if we need just some uh, numbers, like number of uh, objects, uh, it's enough to average the values uh, entered by different uh, annotators or exclude uh, minimal, maximal, so exclude extreme values and then average. Um, <clears throat> then uh, you can also encounter uh, the terms uh, gold standard and silver standard uh, instead of ground truth. Um, because some people use the term ground truth only for synthetic data where the uh, correct answer is known precisely. Uh, while if we use uh, human annotations, uh, it's uh, called sometimes gold standard uh, annotations or gold standard corpus. And uh, in addition, we can also create computer generated uh, annotations uh, by using the best methods uh, that we have and somehow combine their, their output. And this is called silver standard uh, annotations. Uh, produced by computers. Um, of course, silver is worse than gold, but we can generate much more silver annotations than uh, gold annotations. So sometimes these silver annotations generated by computers or combining the best methods uh, are used uh, as well, or they are used as the first step and then they are curated by humans. And finally, concerning data, we need to split them uh, between training and test. Uh, as I mentioned, test data are sometimes uh, kept uh, completely secret, or at least uh, ground truth for test data must be kept uh, secret if we organize some competition. Uh, and 
statisticians call this uh, hold out methods. Um, so, so we just take some part of the data uh, uh, just apart and uh, keep them for, for uh, evaluation. Uh, usually for training, we take a majority of data. For testing, we take minority of data. Uh, but in practice, uh, sometimes even 50-50 ratio is used, but it's better to take more for training and less for testing. And of course, during a division uh, between training and test, we should keep uh, the uh, properties. Uh, so, so both training and test data should uh, Cover the variability of uh, of events or of uh, uh, of data properties. Now, uh, <clears throat> once we have the data, we can uh, think about evaluations or about measures, uh, often called metrics. So the uh, goal of these measures, metrics, is to evaluate the algorithm performance. Uh, by quantitatively comparing the output that the algorithms produce with the correct answer, so with the ground truths. So, for example, we compare output cell masks with ground truth uh, masks. Uh, and there are basically uh, three levels that we can think of. Uh, either we think uh, at pixel level, so we do the pixel classification, uh, which is also called semantic segmentation or we attend to objects, uh, think at object level. Uh, so this is classical object detection task or instance detection task, or sometimes it is also accompanied with classification. And uh, finally, we can seek, uh, think at image level and we can classify whole images uh, into several uh, classes. Now, uh, if we use uh, just Two classes for classification, uh, it's called binary classification. If we use more classes, more than two, it's called uh, general or multi-class uh, classification. But uh, as you see, the, the, the most uh, frequent task uh, is classification. Even segmentation is, or se semantic segmentation is a kind of classification. And then there is a, a special term uh, or special category of task uh, that uh, is worth attention and that is instance segmentation, uh, which is actually a combination of two tasks. One task is to detect the objects or instances, uh, for example, of cells. And the other task is uh, to do semantic segmentation per each object. Uh, so pixel-wise uh, uh, segmentation of each object. Uh, which means these are two things in one uh, that deserve ideally separate evaluation, but I will come uh, to that uh, later on. <clears throat> okay, uh, so as I mentioned, everything or nearly everything is classification. So uh, how do we approach uh, classification? So let's start with the easy binary case. So we have just uh, two classes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's say, for example, we have uh, some infected and non-infected cells, and uh, this uh, le left uh, left part of this image, let's say, are those uh, um, uh, are those infected cells, and the right part are non-infected cells, and the goal is to find the infected cells. So uh, uh, let's say the computer finds uh, the objects within this circle. So uh, these green ones are called true positives. So this is uh, what the computer was expected to do. Uh, these uh, uh, the, the cells that um, are not detected but should have been detected are called false negatives. Then we have uh, cells or objects that uh, were detected but should not have been detected. Those are false positives. And finally, we have uh, objects that were not detected and should have not been detected, and those are true negatives. Uh, this is in general for classification. If we speak about detection, the difference is that we do not have true negatives, because uh, for detection, we just detect objects. We do not classify them. So uh, we have just uh, false negatives, true positives, and false positives. We do not have true negatives. 
And now people have defined different uh, ratios uh, with different names. So the most uh, famous uh, ratios are uh, precision, which is uh, we compare true positives to all positives. So actually this is uh, uh, how precise the method is in terms how uh, many percent of uh, positives uh, it has found. Then we have sensitivity, also called recall, which is uh, true positives divide, divided by uh, true positives plus uh, false negatives. Uh, <clears throat> so this is actually how many uh, um, out of all uh, wanted objects we have found. Uh, then uh, there is specificity that is related to true negatives and Finally, uh, accuracy, where we uh, compute the ratio of true positives and true negatives over all uh, objects, so number of all objects. So everything that was uh, classified correctly divided by the number of objects. And finally, for detection, especially for detection where we do not have true negatives, uh, F1 score, also called F score, is very popular, which is defined as a harmonic mean uh, of precision and recall in this way. It can also be expressed in terms of true positives, false positives, and false negatives. So this is a very popular metric. So this is for a binary case. Now, if we go to the general case uh, where we have three or even more classes, again, uh, the easiest or mo most straightforward metric is accuracy, which means I count uh, all uh, those uh, um, number of objects that have been classified uh, correctly, which is the, the green uh, cells in this table. This table, by the way, is called confusion metrics. Uh, on one axis, I have uh, the actual class. On, on the other axis, I have predicted class. So the diagonal is actually the correct, uh, uh, correct answer and everything else is wrong answer. So accuracy means I compute the number of uh, correct answers divided by the number of all answers. And if we want to compute, uh, in addition to accuracy, if we want to compute precision recall or F1 score for multiple classes, there are multiple approaches. We can do it uh, per class. So we can compute precision recall of one score per class and then compute, for example, average or weighted average where the weights are the, the, the frequencies of occurrence of individual classes. Uh, but that is the less common way. Uh, the most common way is to consider it uh, everything at once. So to compute uh, uh, sort of micro precision, micro recall. So I concentrate on correctly uh, detected true positives divided by true positives plus all false uh, uh, negatives, which means again, green ones divided by all. Uh, so in for, for multi-class, actually this uh, precision and recall are the same as accuracy and the same as of F1. So for multi-class, we, we just speak about uh, one metric and that is accuracy. Uh, we usually do not compute uh, precision recall or F1 score, um, except for some special cases. Um, <clears throat> then uh, there is some dependence of precision and recall. Um, uh, we, we should mention that uh, these two uh, metrics are mutually dependent and uh, uh, we can even plot the dependence uh, sometimes if we have, uh, or if we are able to set different uh, recall levels. Uh, for example, for modern uh, neural networks, we have some probabilities of uh, outputs, so we are able to set different thresholds for those probabilities and uh, we can compute different uh, recall values. And if we plot this precision recall curve, then we can take the area under this curve. And uh, it is a, a, a famous measure called uh, average uh, precision. Um, <clears throat> by the way, all these uh, values that I have already spoken about uh, range from zero to one. Zero is the worst uh, value and one is the best value. Uh, 
so, so also on this axis, recurrent precision go from zero to one and the area under the curve also goes from zero to one. Uh, if we have multiple classes, then we, uh, in addition, average over classes, and this is uh, usually called mean average uh, precision. Um, the values of, uh, let's say, 0 0.9 or uh, 0 0.9 to 1 are usually considered as good results of all these metrics. Uh, let's say between 0 0.6 to 0 0.9, uh, let's say, uh, somehow tolerable or uh, good acceptable uh, and if it's less than let's say 0 0.6 it's uh, not uh, much much uh, of use uh, right and uh, precision and recall speaking about them sometimes we might want to uh, favor one of those uh, and, uh, but i will uh, talk about it later uh, and alternatively, we can have a look at another curve instead of precision recall, uh, sometimes sensitivity uh, versus one minus specificity is plotted. Um, this is usually done in, uh, in the case that we have true negatives as well. So not detection, but a classical classification problem. And then we again compute area under curve. It's called uh, AUC ROC uh, and the area under curve for uh, receive operating characteristics. So this is another statistical uh, thing that we can use. And now uh, how to favor precision or recall. Uh, there is a special uh, metric called a beta score. Uh, here you see the definition. And if you look on the right side, you actually see that uh, false negatives uh, have a beta squared uh, weight, whilst for false positive have, uh, have one weight. So uh, this better regulates uh, the weighting between uh, the importance of false negatives and false positives, and thus regulates the importance of precision or recall. Uh, for beta one, uh, this, uh, this is classical F1 score. So false negatives and positives are equally important. For beta less than one, a precision is favored. So there is higher penalty for false positives. And for beta uh, greater than one, uh, recall is favored. Uh, for example, in medicine, we might want to favor finding uh, cancer cells uh, to uh, producing additional uh, cells that are not actually cancer cells, but uh, they are false positives. Uh, in time-lapse imaging, we might also uh, favor uh, to detect all objects, uh, even if uh, some uh, additional objects that are not there are produced additional false positives. So uh, if one needs to favor equal precision, uh, one can use a better score. Uh, so this was in general for classification. Now uh, let's switch to uh, segmentation. Uh, so uh, for segmentation, meaning uh, uh, here I mean a pixel level uh, thinking. So uh, we uh, compute some masks uh, for objects uh, and uh, we have some masks uh, for, um, uh, for correct answers, so ground truth masks. Um, so let's say uh, this uh, set A is the ground truth and this set, set B is uh, what the algorithm has produced. Uh, and now the common uh, approach to uh, measure the performance of the algorithm is to look at the intersection of uh, the detected object and the ground truth object. And there are two standardized uh, ratios. One ratio is uh, intersection over union, uh, sometimes called the direct intersection over union, IOU, sometimes called Jacquard similarity index. <clears throat> the other ratio is uh, two times uh, intersection divided by the sum of those uh, uh, of the sizes of those objects, which is actually intersection divided by average of the size of those two sizes. And this is actually a uh, pixel level F1 score, uh, alternatively called also dice or dice similarity coefficient. Uh, both these ratios uh, yield the same ranking of the methods. 
So there is actually not uh, much uh, sense in computing both of them. Uh, it's just a matter of preference. Uh, for example, uh, medical imaging community uh, or biomedical imaging community prefers usually dyes, whereas uh, computer vision community usually prefers uh, IOU. And both these ratios are also normalized from zero to one, uh, worst to best. Now, uh, it becomes a bit tricky if we have multiple objects uh, in the image. Uh, so uh, if we uh, deal with, uh, for example, cells, multiple cells in the image, then uh, the uh, correct approach is to treat each cell separately if we want to measure these uh, ratios. And uh, we need to pair the, uh, the, the, the found objects with the ground truth objects. And for each pair, we can compute this, this ratio. Uh, while pairing, we can uh, uh, match the objects uh, either based on, on IOU criterion. This is common in uh, computer vision community, IOU uh, larger than 0.5. Alternatively, in cell imaging, uh, it's uh, maybe even better to use uh, not intersection over union, but actually intersection over reference, uh, size of reference object. So uh, equation uh, that the intersection is larger than 0 0.5 times the size of the reference object. Uh, this has the advantage that it uh, counts uh, also non-splitted objects which is uh, a common mistake in uh, segmentation algorithms in cell imaging that uh, the algorithm produces uh, one object uh, instead of two objects. So uh, the classical computer vision uh, approach uh, will just ignore this result while this uh, alternative approach will uh, count it somehow. And then we can compute average over all objects of uh, this uh, ratio. Um, and uh, now, uh, so, so this was for pixel-wise segmentation, let's say semantic segmentation. And now uh, a few words, few more words about instance segmentation, because I mentioned it's a problematic thing because it's a uh, two-in-one. Uh, it's the detection and uh, segmation, pixel-wise segmentation in one. So uh, wrong approach to instant segmentation uh, uh, evaluation is to compute just dice or just IOU over the whole image uh, <clears throat> because we have uh, multiple objects there and we are interested in, uh, have, in evaluating each of them separately. Uh, another wrong approach is to compute just object detection metric for just, for example, one fixed uh, IOU value because then we evaluate only detection part and not the segmentation part of the uh, instant segmentation. The correct approach is to use one metric for object detection and one metric for pixel-wise segmentation, uh, but per object, and then we can average over objects, as I mentioned on the previous slide, or alternatively, sometimes what is used is uh, just one metric that combines both, uh, so we basically use object detection metric uh, like F1 score, AP or whatever, but we compute it for different IOU thresholds with a certain step, like for example, 0 0.95, 0 0.9, 0 0.85 up to 0 0.5. And then we just average over these IOU thresholds. Uh, as an example, I have here 2018, the famous Kegel uh, data science ball nucleus segmentation challenge. Uh, that uh, computed F1 score for these different uh, IOU thresholds and then averaged. So instant segmentation is probably the most complicated uh, uh, task to, to evaluate uh, from all these. Uh, in addition to overlap-based uh, metrics, we also have uh, shape-based metrics. Uh, the Classical representative of this shape-based shape matrix is Hausdorff distance, which is actually, uh, let's say the longest out of the shortest distances between the two boundaries. So we have the reference boundary and we have the found boundary by the algorithm. And we are interested in distances between these boundaries. And uh, 
First, we compute uh, the largest distance, let's say, from the green boundary to the blue boundary, and then vice versa. It's not the same because the largest distance from one curve to the other is not the same as the opposite. So we have to compute both directions. And then what is done is usually maximum is taken. So this is basically the largest error in the uh, boundary displacement from the ground truth. Uh, the disadvantage of this Hausdorff distance is that it's very sensitive to outliers. So if we have just one uh, pro protrusion uh, in the whole boundary, it may spoil the whole result. Um, the alternatives that I usually used and preferred over the classical Hausdorff distance are uh, alternatives that suppress extremes, extreme values uh, of the, all these distances computed. So we compute, for example, all those distances uh, along boundaries. We have many values with certain steps. And then we, uh, uh, let's say, uh, disregard 5% of extremes. Uh, and we uh, compute the 95th percentile of all those distance values. So this is less sensitive to outliers to extreme uh, uh, distances that are very, very rare. Uh, alternatively, we can compute average uh, of those, all those distances. So this is uh, just to tell you that uh, we have also shape-based uh, metrics. Uh, concerning just simple measurements like position, lens, or size, area, uh, what is done is usually we measure a root mean square distance, uh, which is just square root of sum of squares of, uh, of distances. Uh, it can be measured in 2D, in 3D. So this is classical metric for, uh, for positions or lens measurements. And uh, finally, for um, comparing uh, signals like 1D signals or even images, we can also compute uh, correlations. So if we need to compare one image to another image, like pixel-wise, uh, whether they are similar, uh, then correlation is used. Uh, usually it is normalized in, in this way as you see it, but uh, due to time requirements, sometimes the uh, denominator uh, is omitted and only numerator is computed, uh, then it is called cross-correlation without normalization. Uh, alternatively, uh, 1D signals can be, uh, if we have two of them, uh, so one measured and one reference, we can plot uh, uh, the scatter plots, so one signal uh, against the other one. Uh, if they are similar, we will get uh, points, uh, experimental points along one, uh, one line, a straight line. Uh, if they are not similar, it will be somehow uh, random, uh, or there can be even negative correlation, uh, then uh, <clears throat> it, it, it goes uh, um, the other way around. Uh, so not from uh, bottom to top, from left to right, but uh, from top to bottom, from left to right. Uh, so this is standard correlation, uh, I think, uh, correlation coefficient that ranges from uh, one to minus one. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the summary of what uh, I have talked about concerning metrics. Uh, so classification, segmentation, shape similarity, and so on. Uh, alternatively, we can also measure speed uh, and memory consumption. Might also be interesting as additional information, uh, maybe not to uh, uh, rank the methods, but uh, as additional information. And if we have multiple metrics, we have to merge them. Uh, but uh, it is always interesting, for example, in the papers to publish them separately if, if they are measured, not only after merging. And if we want to merge them, for example, to uh, get some winners of some competition, then we should uh, assign some weights to individual metrics and compute, for example, weighted average of multiple metrics after we normalize all metrics uh, to the interval zero to one, ideally. Uh, many metrics are naturally uh, normalized from zero to one. Other metrics like Hausdorff are not normalized. We have to normalize them. Um, 
And uh, if we merge multiple metrics, we have to take special attention uh, if they are mutually dependent, then it's uh, not, for example, good to uh, take precision and recall uh, like uh, with some weighted uh, average of, of them. But uh, of course, if we have precision recall or sensitivity versus specificity, it's better to do it using uh, area under curve uh, measurement if possible. Okay, so that was about metrics. And now just a few words about existing uh, or summary and existing uh, benchmarks metrics. Uh, so this is uh, just once again, what I have spoken about summary, uh, about the representative needs, annotations, uh, splitting the data. Um, it's always uh, nice to also provide tools uh, software that compute the measures to participants of the benchmarks or changes, um, because if they program it themselves, so then they might uh, do some error in the metric computation and it will spoil their uh, competition, their participation in the competition. And uh, of course, uh, we should uh, do it ideally open a science way. So release the data sets, training data, tools, uh, everything somewhere on the web, uh, except for uh, test the data uh, ground truth or even test the data themselves. Uh, concerning benchmarks, uh, there are uh, multiple benchmarks around not associated with uh, any competitions changes. Uh, probably the most famous one is the Broad Biomet Benchmark Collection, uh, BBBC at Broad Institute, uh, but there are some others. Uh, this BBBC uh, runs from 2008 and they have a uh, quite large collection of uh, uh, annotated images, both uh, simulated and uh, real, uh, mostly real, and uh, they can provide annotations for them. Uh, at our university, we have some database of synthetic uh, images of uh, cells, tissues at different uh, SNR ratios, clustering or the densities, uh, clustering uh, probabilities, and so on. And uh, Probably the uh, most important resource is uh, the list of all uh, challenges uh, in biomedical imaging, including bioimaging at grant-challenge.org uh, uh, that is maintained by Brem van Hineken from the Netherlands. And there you can find uh, several hundreds of uh, challenges that have been run uh, up to date in, and with links to uh, the web pages and, uh, and data sets uh, and so on. Uh, concerning uh, bioimaging, uh, these are the earliest challenges up to 2015. You see already the initial challenges were quite diverse uh, concerning topics. Uh, there were uh, different uh, areas uh, treated. And uh, many of them were repeated uh, multiple times. Uh, we ourselves uh, have uh, been running uh, already for 10 years, uh, one of them, and that's cell tracking challenge. Um, so uh, finally, a few words about it. So what we do here at uh, Masaryk University, uh, we uh, take uh, about cell tracking challenge uh, since 2015, which is a challenge uh, that uh, provides data sets uh, of uh, time lapse uh, sequences uh, of, of cells of different types. And uh, the goal, there are two benchmarks, one is for segmentation and one is for tracking. Um, examples of uh, images. Um, yeah, here is the, the, the challenge history. Uh, we have had uh, some fixed date competitions uh, at different ISBs, uh, already six of them, but we evaluate also continuously each month uh, the submissions. And here are some examples of the data sets uh, from the first edition, from the second edition, from the uh, third edition. Uh, in the third edition, we included also a very difficult Drosophila embryogenesis data set uh, from light microscopy. 
uh, and then uh, fourth edition uh, and fifth edition, even more complicated embryogenesis data set of a beetle called Trilobium castaneum. Um, <clears throat> and finally, some uh, other modalities like DIC, we also have face contrast, bright field, uh, and, and so on. And we had to develop one uh, special metric because for segmentation, we used Jacquard IOU, but for tracking, there was no metric around. So we had to develop a new metric comparing actually the reference graph with the uh, participant graph uh, because the result of tracking is some lineage tree. So uh, we had to compare trees or more precisely forests, uh, uh, many trees to each other. And uh, we invented some metric uh, comparing these trees, uh, and we uh, published it and used it in the cell tracking uh, challenge. Basically, basically, we compute the number of errors while transforming uh, in the easiest way one tree to the other tree. And these are the organizers of uh, our challenge. Uh, so this was just an example uh, of what we uh, take care about here. Uh, for 10 years, and uh, here are uh, final slides, some uh, references. Uh, in a large uh, international collaboration, we have published uh, two papers about metrics uh, focused on uh, pixel level, object level, as well as image level uh, <clears throat> um, focus. Uh, so object detection, semantic segmentation, instant segmentation tasks. And we uh, analyzed their pitfalls and uh, recommended which metrics to use in which situations or not to use. Uh, then I wrote uh, a book chapter on benchmarking challenges some time ago, but the main principles are still valid. Uh, I mentioned already the very useful database of challenges at grantchallenge.org. And here is the reference for our cell tracking challenge and for a paper about some peculiarities of challenges. Uh, so, uh, to, to say uh, that rankings in these competitions are not always uh, or should not always be taken uh, as uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, clear uh, thing. Uh, there are some problems with uh, some uh, challenges and with some rankings, uh, so, so the interpretation should be done with care. Uh, because sometimes rankings are very sensitive. Uh, if you take a small part of test data away and uh, recompute uh, the rankings change. So uh, it's not easy actually to make the benchmark or challenge uh, prone to, uh, let's say, small changes in test data or other small, small changes. Um, it, it's quite complicated uh, field and still uh, being researched uh, how to organize uh, challenges and benchmarks and, and metrics uh, appropriately. So uh, that's uh, shortly about uh, all these uh, metrics and challenges and uh, you're welcome to ask questions. Thank you for the attention. So we're gonna uh, introduce you to Fireflows, which is uh application for benchmarking and uh, reproducibly uh, deploying bioimage analysis workflows. So this is the outline. There is uh, Sebastian and Benjamin who are with me and uh, each one will present uh, a part of it. Uh, so the first uh, thing, uh, the first part is me. I will talk about the uh, reproducibility aspect uh, of the software. Um, so you heard about the matrix and um, Bioflows is uh, for benchmarking, but it can also help with uh, reproducibly deploying image analysis software. Uh, yeah, so then I will just, uh, after that, I will just give a, a short impression of the architecture, of the software architecture of the, uh, of the application. And then Sebastian will uh, give you a demo um, and show you the content which is actually currently there. And uh, Benjamin will uh, show you how you can add new content. So for example, the problems uh, that program classes that are already there, it's like training or, or filament tracing or nuclear detection. But if you wanted to compare uh, deconvolution algorithms, you would have to add uh, 
a new problem class. Um, and then I will show you how you can add uh, your own workflows into BioFlows so that you can uh, use the benchmarking and also run them uh, on in the cloud or on your own machine. And finally, uh, Sebastian will talk about uh, future developments. Okay, so let's start with reproducibility. So reproducibility uh, in science means uh, usually that a researcher can duplicate a result of a prior study using the same materials and procedures as were used by the original group who did this. Now, it's not so clear. There's a bit of confusion about the vocabulary. So let's have a, a little look at this. To repeat something would mean the same lab runs the same experiment with the same setup, just repeat. Then replicate, another independent lab runs the same experiment with the same setup and reproduce another lab varies the experiment or the setup. And uh, there is uh, different usages of these two words. So if you read some papers about it, you have to look uh, what the persons actually mean by replicate or reproduce. And uh, then there would be reuse, that would be to transfer uh, the, the setup or the experiment to another experiment. Uh, use it as a, a, a building block of another one, for example. So now we are here concerned about uh, the bioimage analysis software. And of course, you would think this as a computer program, so it's very easy. You run it, uh, each time you run it on the same data, you get the same results. And of course, that is true to a point, but your software doesn't live in an isolated island somewhere. It uh, is usually a uh, has a lot of, it can add, have a lot of dependencies. It lives kind of on the internet and this environment is changing over time. And uh, if there's no maintenance of your software, usually it will stop working uh, in a, yeah, after some time. It could be like a short time or, or, or longer time. And this phenomenon is called uh, software rot and it's actually a, a, re a research topic in software engineering. So if let's have a look at uh, bioimage analysis in the context of uh, a scientific project. So the researcher has a hypothesis about uh, biological objects and he wants to test it uh, using uh, uh, imaging. So uh, he goes, uh, he, first, he does his experiments with his cells, prepares his objects, then uh, goes to the microscope, takes the images, and use bioimage analysis to extract data from these images, and then uh, uses data analysis to extract information from this data, and then comes to a conclusion about the hypothesis. So why should it be reproducible? Now the science should of course be reproducible if uh, another group cannot reproduce what, what a group did, then we usually don't accept this as, a, uh, as being a true result. Um, and of course, if we would build on uh, unreproducible uh, results, then we would probably waste a lot of time on uh, drawing conclusions from erroneous uh, things uh, that, uh, from, from an erroneous base. Um, and uh, concerning the software aspect, uh, as a bioimage analyst, we also want to reuse uh, bioimage analysis workflows, of course. And if they're not even reproducible, there's a little chance that they are reusable. So who would want to reproduce or reuse bioimage analysis workflows? First one would probably be the reviewers of a publication. Uh, then there would be other biologists or analysts uh, who want to do a similar or the same analysis on their own data. And uh, of course, software developers, uh, people writing plugins or, or platforms for image analysis uh, might want to build tools on this. And uh, last but not least, uh, the, the original author or his group might want to use it uh, again later. 
And of course, you know all the situation, the PhD student who wrote the analysis, he is not there anymore, and no one knows uh, how to do it. <clears throat> so why is it uh, difficult? What are the problems? So if you can see, the basic idea is if you come, if you have a bioimage analysis workflow described in a publication, ideally, you would have a link, you could go there and you could uh, immediately uh, execute it uh, on with the provided uh, data and parameters and then also try it on your own images. But it's not often like this, of course. Sometimes uh, even algorithm is not available. You, I guess this case where uh, it's only written to use this or that platform like we used image G for the image analysis. I guess that's not really uh, accepted by, uh, by journals these days anymore, luckily. So now if the algorithm is described but not implemented, then uh, there are two questions. Are there enough details that I can implement it? And uh, how much effort would, it would this take? Could be that it's just too difficult to be realistic. In, uh, okay, there might be uh, easy cases uh, where it can be done, but in other cases, it might be very difficult. Then if uh, there is an implementation, uh, I would also need probably documentation to be able to install parameterize and run it. And uh, let's say all of this is available, but I don't have uh, the original data and parameters that were used in the study. <clears throat> so then if I try to run it myself and it doesn't work, uh, I don't know, is it because it's not adapted for my data? Is it because I'm using the wrong parameters or is it just not working? <clears throat> and now the case that all this is available, I could still have uh, trouble to make it run in my own setup uh, because it was done on a different operating system or the uh, the dependencies that it wants to install are conflicting with my system libraries and so on. And of course, if my users on the facility often want or sometimes want to use older software, and then there could, could be a problem that the platform or even the operating system is outdated and are not uh, used anymore. So if the problem is, uh, but a lot of things are, are missing, then the solution is to make everything available more or less. So uh, make available the analysis workflow as an algorithm and as an implementation in the form of scripts, macros, plugins, whatever. Make the uh, whole environment available, the uh, operating system, the libraries used, uh, uh, the software platform, uh, and of course, all these with the version that was used. Yeah, you need the documentation and of course, documentation should tell how to do things. But uh, in the long run, it is also important to say why things are done the way they were done. Okay, and uh, not to forget, of course, the data and the parameters used. So make all this in a public place on the internet and since uh, things on the internet are not eternal, either keep a local backup. So this is realistic. It sounds pretty demanding, a lot of work, but actually uh, at the time where we're creating the analysis workflow, almost all this is, uh, is there, except probably for the documentation, which is always done later. Um, and luckily now we have, uh, tools and technologies that can help us with this. So I guess everyone knows Git and GitHub by now and has probably heard about uh, containerization, Docker, we, use, we will use Docker and Singularity in Bioflows. I will talk a little bit later about this in more detail. And there are also Jupyter notebooks, which are a, a great way uh, to showcase, to, to document code uh, with the documentation just around it. <clears throat> and for the data, there are public repositories like the IDR, 
you can use an Omerode or Cetomine or any other image database, or there is a Xenodo where you can put uh, your data, and uh, of course now our BioFlows. So I guess everyone knows Git and GitHub. So Git is the distributed source code management and version control system. So everything which is textual, your uh, your macros, your code, your scripts, can and or any other uh, programming code can can very well go there. And the GitHub is the 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 public hosting system uh, for for Git repositories which is by now very popular and you could say the de facto standard for open source software projects. And there are also a lot of tools for building software, for doing a lot of things uh, around GitHub. Okay, similarly, Docker uh, lets you create a container that contains <coughs> the whole operating system, all the dependencies of your workflow and the workflow itself. Um, the Docker images, they run isolated one from the other, uh, uh, but um, in contrast to virtual machines, they are lightweight, so they are not this uh, uh, heavy like a, a full virtual machine because they share the same underlying operating system. And they are created from a Docker file which tells which things to install. And like in the case with Git and GitHub, there is a Docker hub which hosts Docker images, um, you can we can build them in the cloud. Actually, we will build them on GitHub and then push them to the Docker Hub. And uh, once they're on Docker Hub, you can run them from everywhere by just typing the if you have a Docker installed on your machine by just typing uh, Docker and the name of the image. Uh, and BioFlows is calling them for you, of course, in the interface. Okay, now let's have a look. Uh, you will see this in the demo. But let's just have a, a little look uh, at which point BioFlows can help with the reproducibility. So to uh, to have a workflow, image analysis workflow in BioFlows, you need to have four files basically in your in a GitHub uh, uh, repository, which is a Docker file, which tells you how to create the environment, a descriptor, which is about the parameters. The macro here you see is uh, your workflow. It could be a Python program, it could be a, a cell profiler, it could be a, any platform. And then a wrapper that will run, that will download uh, images, uh, run the uh, analysis workflow, and upload the results. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing your workflow is there, it is on GitHub, the source code is there, and it is versioned. And also you make releases so that you have uh, uh, so that you have tags which you can uh, <clears throat> which can which you can communicate communicate uh, about the version that you used uh, in a publication, for example. And now you will have uh, execute the same the, the the workflow executable in BioFlows and linked to the code. <clears throat> So the second is the Docker file, which builds the environment. So it will uh, specify the operating system, install, for example, imagery and the plugins you need for your, in this example, uh, workflow in the form of a macro. Um, and you have the executable image that is on Docker Hub and all connected with each other. Okay, so about the parameters, they are in the descriptor file. So uh, uh, there is a description and the names that will show up in the web interface, in the, in the user interface. Um, the, and uh, the, default, the default values. And I think we will see next when you run, the parameters used will also be recorded in buyer flows. So here you see in uh, BioFlows, you can you have the links to the source code and to the Docker image. Yeah, okay. Here you see uh, when you run 
a workflow, you know which version of the workflow you, you ran, and all this is recorded and remains there, and you have the parameters with, with which it was run. Okay, that's uh, the end of the reprodu reproducibility part, and here's just the uh, general architecture. So we have the four files that define everything <laughs> of the uh, Bioflows uh, image analysis workflow on the GitHub repository. When we make a release on GitHub, it will automatically create an image, a Docker image that will be pushed to the Docker Hub. And from there, it is available uh, via Docker from, uh, or from anywhere, from any machine that wants to access it. it uh, we have the uh, official Bioflows uh, web application. And you could also, since it is an open source based on a cytomine, you can also install your own local instance of Bioflows on your machine. Um, there's very good documentation of all this, so it should not be uh, too difficult. And you can also just run the Docker images if you just if you don't care about, for example, the benchmarking and having it in the web interface. You could just run the Docker images directly uh, on your local machine. Good. So uh, thanks, Walker, for the the, the overview of uh, of Bioflow. So. In my part, I will uh, we, we we will have a, a demo of the of the platform, and I will uh, show you a bit more again on 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 what Volker has has introduced. But uh, before doing this, just a, a small comment on the workflows themselves. Um, so we try to be inclusive, meaning um, to enable people to add workflows coming from a, a very broad range of uh, of bioimage analysis platforms, Fiji. Uh, uh, cell profiler, elastic, etc., and it can also be actually a standalone uh, code, like something you you compile in in any programming language. So it's uh, it's really flexible, but of course, so that the workflows interface to uh, to Bioflows, uh, it has to fulfill some uh, minimum requirements. Uh, it has to be um, callable from the common line in uh, in your operating system. And it should also pass uh, the parameters uh, of the workflow itself, no? so like the functional parameters, including also an input and an output folder, because the, the workflow should be built in a way that they will uh, process uh, or can process uh, multiple images that are, that are stored in an input folder. And they should store the result in uh, an output folder that is uh, passed through the, the, the command line. Uh, so it's uh, it's basically quite uh, well, quite simple requirements, of course. But I will introduce this uh, later on. We also have what we call problem classes. So depending whether you do object segmentation, object detection, uh, etc., or tracking, uh, the format that the the workflow should um, uh, output as a result uh, is also predefined in Bioflows, and you you should comply to it. Uh, we try to use simple formats that are broadly used and also uh, simple to, to implement to limit like the, the requirement on adapting existing workflows to, to make them compatible. Uh, as uh, Volker has said, you basically need four files to define a workflow. And luckily, you don't have to do much rewriting most of the time because you can also reuse existing workflows as a template. Uh, for instance, if you use the same uh, operating system, uh, same bioimage analysis platform, you can basically copy most of uh, this file from existing um, uh, workflows and just um, loosely uh, uh, adapt or customize them. Uh, the only part that has to be uh, heavily edited or even rewritten is, of course, the workflow itself. Uh, it's, uh, it's specific and also the descriptor. So the, the parameters are usually different from a, a workflow to the other. But it, this part is quite simple to edit. So let's uh, have a look at the, um, at the platform itself. So as Volker said, I mean, we, we are running a, a, an instance on, in, a, in the cloud in, on, a, on our own server. Uh, you can find it at this URL that is in the slide. Uh, 
So I will just connect to this uh, 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 web address and, uh, and we will have a look. If you want some help, uh, the best place is on uh, Image SC forum. Uh, we are a community partners, so you, you can throw in question in there and we will also answer them. Here, I have already, I'm already on the uh, landing page when you, you go to this uh, URL. Uh, so here, as you can see on the left, we also have uh, links to uh, the documentation, uh, which is quite extensive. We will cover most of it during the end zone uh, with Benjamin and Volker, uh, but you have it here as a, as a reference. Um, you also have the code repository of Biaflows. It's open source, so if you want to install it or look at the code, you can have a look there. And so you have the code of the of Biaflows itself uh, sitting there, and also of uh, many workflows that have already been introduced uh, in in the system. So. Uh, and then finally, if you want to contribute some uh, annotated data sets or workflows, uh, you can also click on this link and, and, and get some more instructions. Uh, here you have a, a short presentation also and a small video uh, that basically cover what I will show in the, in the demo, uh, maybe in less details. Uh, so if you want to uh, start the system, you just press here, start online. This is the flow we will follow uh, during the demo. It's also here as a reminder, but basically you typically start uh, with problems. So you, you see here in this uh, upper header, you have problems, work, workflows and storage. So if I go here to problems, I can see all the problems that are uh, currently available. Uh, so here you see the name and we always try to add a short description of uh, uh, what it's about, and also importantly, where are the annotated images uh, coming from? Uh, the annotated images we use for the for the benchmark. Uh, basically, it's a mixture of existing uh, annotated data set coming from challenges or image repository, and also some synthetic images. Uh, so we run this uh, generator that uh, 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 Michael introduced. Uh, to, to create some images. Uh, again, in this case, we also link to the simulator that was used, of course, uh, each time. Uh, as you can see, I mean, the list is, is quite uh, extensive already. Uh, I will have a slide where I, I describe more in, in details what's in there. But uh, let's start with the uh, demo. So I will show you a, a demo. Uh, nuclei segmentation, so uh, of the class object segmentation uh, that you see here, nuclei segmentation. So if I click here, I can have some uh, information that the class of this uh, problem is object segmentation, or I, sh I should say instance segmentation to be more accurate. You can see a thumbnail of uh, the images. And if you click on the uh, problem itself, you see the list of uh, images uh, that will be used to run the workflow and, and perform the, the benchmark. Um, if you further click on one of these images, you access to this uh, uh, image uh, remote viewer. So you can zoom in and out. Uh, I will move this because it's a bit in the way. You see that by default, we have this uh, uh, blue uh, annotation. This is the ground truth annotation for the image. If you click here on the right, uh, you can basically uh, toggle the uh, overlay of the annotation to see like just the raw image. You can also adjust uh, uh, contrast as in uh, a typical uh, image viewer or clip the background as I'm doing here. And uh, interestingly, you can also add several viewers. So let's add a new viewer uh, with the same image. I will link the two viewers. So now when I zoom in and out, I have a synchronized view. Here, of course, we are looking at the same thing on both sides, so it's not very interesting, but what I could do on the, on the right side, for instance, is to uh, remove the ground truth annotation. And I can, uh, for instance, see the result of uh, one of the workflows that have already been run in the system. Uh, for instance, here we have a, an image uh, segmentation workflow for this problem, so you can add the layer. And now if you uh, move around, you can see uh, 
in a synchronized way uh, the ground truth and what the uh, image workflow in this case has uh, detected as objects. You can also have more than uh, two viewers. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, for instance, do uh, four viewers and also very easily uh, synchronize them uh, uh, to have like uh, more than, than two uh, 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 workflow at the same time. So this is for the viewer part. Now let's focus on the on the workflow and the workflow runs. So you can see here on this tab, here we are in the images. If I go to the workflow runs, here you can see uh, the workflows that have been uh, run in the past in the system. So for instance, looking at the image workflows I've just shown, it's here. If you click here, you can see so that it has been uh, run at that time here. And the parameters that were used to run the workflow are uh, also saved in by the system. So if I show them here, I can see like uh, we have two parameter radius and threshold, and these were the values that were used. You can also have a complete uh, view at the execution log. So uh, like when the workflow was called, all the output that was sent to the console is also recorded. So you can uh, and kept for record, and you can have uh, a view at it. Uh, to run a workflow, you just have to press on this uh, button here uh, on top. Uh, so for instance, if I run again the same workflow, the image A workflow uh, version 1.12.10, I have the two parameters. These are the default values. So they are typically values that are optimized for the set of images, but you can also uh, play with a different value if you want. And there is also a way to document uh, the parameters. Here it's a bit minimal, but you, you can uh, write this more extensively. And this is done actually in the parameter descriptor. So this uh, of the four files that are in the, in the GitHub repository. Uh, here I will run the workflow with the default value. Uh, so as you can see, it's here on the top uh, with the date uh, and the hour when, when I'm running it. And it will take some time, so I will just leave it run. If you go to the bottom part of the uh, table, you see the benchmark results. So uh, basically for all this uh, workflow run, uh, the results were created by the workflow and also uh, seg some segmentation, uh, some uh, uh, benchmark metrics were computed uh, by comparing the ground truth annotation uh, to the results of the workflow. So uh, Michael already introduced this, uh, some of these metrics um, we are dealing with instance segmentation. So as he explained, the most meaningful met, uh, metric is the mean average precision that was introduced in the um, uh, science ball uh, nuclear segmentation challenge in 2018. So it's here in, uh, in BioFlows and it's uh, computed automatically for you. We actually use the, the original code from the challenge. So we, we didn't re-implement this. Here you also have the dice coefficient and the uh, Osdorf, average Osdorf distance. And this metric is a metric that we designed ourselves, uh, but essentially the mean average precision is, is quite close and, and probably um, a better option. But uh, it illustrates that you can have more than one metric, uh, which is nice. Uh, typically, in the first column, we always have the metric we consider as being uh, the most relevant, but we also uh, leave them for uh, yeah, as a reference. You can order um, the um, uh, workflow runs uh, by any of these metrics, so from uh, worst to best in this case, or the opposite. Here you see the average of the metric on all the images. So in this case, we had 10 images in this problem. You can also uh, see some other statistics like the median uh, of, uh, of the metrics or other uh, statistics of interest. And also, and I think it's uh, quite useful, here you see the results for all the images, but you can also inspect the results of the metric per image. So if you click on this detailed result per image, here you see the 10 images. And if I open it here, now I have just the metric result for this specific image. Because in some cases, uh, a workflow can uh, fail badly on some specific image that have some artifacts or maybe, I don't know, like higher intensity or lower intensity. So it's a, 
it's a very uh, simple and fast way to, to check for this kind of, of uh, issues. Uh, you see here that the, uh, we have these tick boxes. So if you click on a tick box, you can add or remove uh, in the, uh, let's say, uh, final table, uh, one of the workflow runs. And this starring system is something we also introduced. So the uh, a starred workflow should be like a workflow with uh, optimum parameters. So let's say if you are the author of the workflow and you optimize the parameter for the uh, training or test data that, that is used, um, you can start it to say that it, it's the reference, let's say. But then you can have other run with different uh, parameter and compare the results. So here, as you can see, the uh, execution of the uh, workflow I just run uh, has been successful. Uh, I can also uh, add the results to the table. And as you can see for images, they are uh, essentially matching. Uh, proving like it's a zero level reproducibility. We, we get the same, same numbers if we run it twice with the same parameters. Uh, you can also delete uh, a run. In this case, I will delete it because uh, I already have it with the same uh, uh, parameters. Okay, so this is for the uh, automatic computation of the benchmark uh, uh, metrics. Uh, Regarding the workflows, if you click on one of them, uh, so let's do it with the image, you jump to this page uh, where you have some statistics on how many times the workflow has been run, how many times it was successful, etc. And importantly, you also have a link to the source code on GitHub. Uh, so if you click on this button, you jump to the uh, GitHub repository where you can see the files that were described by uh, uh, Volker. And you also have a link to the uh, uh, Docker Hub, so uh, where the image uh, of this uh, of this workflow is is sitting in the web. Um, so I think that's essentially it. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, problems, I can show you. Um, another problem with more dimensions. So these were only two uh, D images. Uh, but the viewer and the wall framework also support uh, images with uh, higher dimensions. Uh, for instance, for uh, nuclei tracking here. Uh, in this case, we only have a, a, a single image. I mean, Bioflows is still a, a prototype. So in terms of content, uh, it's still uh, rather empty. We are we're, we're still uh, uh, expanding and testing it. Um, so let me show you like a result from this uh, workflow, which is coming also from the cell tracking challenge uh, that uh, Mikhail introduced. And I will remove the ground truth. So here for this kind of problems, you have the option to also see um, the overlay of the object uh, with color code by ID. So an object across time will maintain the same uh, color or same ID. And you can uh, scroll through the through movie to, to see it. Uh, we also have uh, 3D uh, images, uh, object segmentation, also filament tracing. I have actually a slide on this that I will uh, switch to now. So currently, we have uh, these problem classes, uh, nine of them. Uh, we have object counting and detection, so basically just a landmark per object. Uh, and the annotation associated to it are just binary mask with a single uh, bright pixel in the uh, where the objects are sitting. An example would be a vesicle uh, detection. We also have landmark detection, uh, for instance, in Drosophila wing. So in this case, you also have like a label mask with a single uh, dot per landmark, but it can also have a class associated to it in case you have different kind of landmarks. Object segmentation that we have seen, we have uh, especially nuclei in 2D and 3D uh, segmentation, and the annotations are label masks. Uh, pixel classification, uh, again, we have label mask, but in this case, it's sem semantic uh, uh, segmentation. So it's just a matter of classifying a pixel in a, in a given class, uh, for instance, uh, tumor or gland. Uh, filament tree tracing, for instance, for neurons. Uh, and in this case, we use the SWC annotation format for trees. 
uh, filament network tracing, such as blood vessels, so you can have loops in the networks. Here we use uh, binary masks of skeletons. Particle tracking, uh, in the case of non-dividing nuclei, we have just label masks. And in the case of a dividing object, for instance, dividing nuclei, we use the same format as in the cell tracking challenge. So we have label mask and also uh, an, an extra file, a text file with a division of the objects when they occur. So I think that's it. Uh, just as a summary, as, as uh, Volker was uh, saying, I mean, uh, the idea of Bioflows is to have everything in the same place and to record everything that is done. So every workflow that is run. Uh, so we have sitting in the same place annotated uh, data sets, images, uh, standard data format and metrics for nine problem uh, classes. Uh, version workflows with their full execution environments, so as uh, Docker uh, images. Actually, they are converted to singularity images to, to be run uh, in, um, for instance, HPC environment, but it's, uh, it's just a technical detail. Uh, default parameters that are optimized for the data sets and a way to visualize the results. So uh, with this um, uh, remote image viewing uh, viewer that I've shown you and the uh, possibility to synchronize different viewers and also automatic uh, computation of the benchmark metrics and a way to visualize them in interactive table. Uh, so statistics or per image. Uh, so with this, I'm finished and I will uh, uh, leave Benjamin uh, introduce the next part. So how to add new problem and content to uh, Bioflows. Uh, so um, I will show you how to uh, uh, create a new uh, problem and to upload the uh, images uh, for this problem. So if you go to the website, you can, uh, so by default, uh, there is a try on uh, button here. If you click on it, you will be uh, automatically uh, connected as a sandbox uh, user. So I will do the demo under this username. Uh, you can go to uh, problem. Um, so it uh, before and there is this uh, button here, a uh, new problem that uh, you can click on to uh, create a new problem. I will call it uh, OS. Or maybe I if you want to push. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so you end up in this. Uh, Tab here, so where you can um, uh, set some uh, parameters. Uh, by default, I will leave them uh, uh, like that. I will just uh, change the problem class here. Uh, so because there are two D nuclei, uh, this is a more an object segmentation problem. So we select this this class and save it. Uh, uh, other than that, you can define uh, which members of uh, which user can access to the, the problem. So by default, it's only uh, the people who create a, a new problem. So uh, I will add a couple of people. Uh, so they will be able to use it. So for example, Diani, uh, the grand choose, maybe the guest, the user, and maybe that's all. Oh, maybe as people, okay. And then I click on add. Okay, then you can customize the, the graphical interface that displays uh, the problem. So here we just uh, add the workflow uh, run, so people will be able to run workflow on it. So I can uh, select that. So contributor. Uh, I can now add uh, the workflow that I would like to be able to start uh, to run on, the, on this uh, problem. Uh, and I can search for that. So I can use a similar one, the nuclear segmentation. And then maybe I add another one from PG. There's plenty here. Um, I can just start this one. I just take another one. Uh, 
select them. So I added them. And then finally, uh, there's image filters where you can uh, uh, display uh, some filtered images, but we won't go there. Uh, then uh, we are done. So I can go to the images here. Um, I know I can go to information first and maybe uh, uh, add a quick description of the problem. Uh, so here are the summary of the problem. So right now there is no images, six members. Uh, I can add a description so I can click on add here. And then I prefer a small description. So I took the data set from uh, the BBC uh, uh, website of the Boyd Institute. So it's one of their data sets, a uh, portion of the data sets. Uh, so I will add also the link. Okay. All right. So I can check the problem class is uh, object segmentation. Everything is fine. Uh, okay. So now I can go to storage. And then I can uh, start to add the images uh, that I want to, uh, to add to this problem. So the the raw images and the ground truth. So those images, as mentioned earlier, they have to be uh, um, in OMT format. And uh, the file name has to be uh, the following. So, uh, so here's my example here. So I have my images like that. So the real name, I didn't change the name, is from the, the BBC uh, platform. And the ground truth is the same, but contain underscore uh, LDL for label. And that's important to add if you want uh, BioFlow to recognize uh, those images as uh, the conscious label. Uh, otherwise, it won't be recognized. So if I, uh, I, you just need to add that. So after that, I click on add files here. And then I can select uh, my files. So. So we have first the images. And then I will add the one first. And then you can click on start upload. To start the upload. It should be fine because there are very small images. Okay. Uh, start. Uh, now, if I go to my uh, problem, so this is this one. Uh, oh, I forgot something. Sorry, <laughs> I made a mistake. Uh, when you're in storage, I should have precise to which problem I want to send it. So that's my bad. Uh, here, you can select a link to the problem, and I should have selected the uh, uh, my problem. Which is uh, the very last one. So I should have done that to directly put the images to the the right uh, my new problem. So now it's not the case, so it's going to be a different link. So maybe I can just uh do it. So now, you yeah, you can see the images, but the, the, the problem here is the labels are not uh, visible yet. So if I click here, and, uh, if I change the, yeah, so I can see the images, but I don't see the ground truth. 
it's not available uh, yet. And uh, there is a, a thing that we have to improve is to uh, automatically convert the labels to the, to the images. So right now it's possible, but you need to uh, do it uh, via a command line too. Um, this tool is uh, available. So everything is described. Sorry. Okay, so everything is described here. I click on the program, so I did all that. And now I need to uh, update the images. So that's, I did that already. But now I, did, I need to do that. Convert the ground truth images to annotations. So for that, we created the tool. It's a Docker tool. So what you need to uh, install it and to use it is uh, to have a Git to clone the, the tool and then Docker to uh, run it because it's uh, it's just a Docker image. So I describe, find the documentation is described how to uh, install it. So I will just show you how to use it and the result and not uh, the installation because it takes some time to, uh, to create the Docker image. Um, so I'm here. And uh, what you need, uh, so here's the command line. So basically, uh, you, you Docker run, and then you give the tag to your Docker image. And then you need several parameters. You need, of course, the tag, that means uh, the Docker image name you used to when you created your uh, Docker image. Then you need the site domain host address, uh, the public key, the private key, and the project ID. So how do you find those parameters? So uh, the site domain, uh, the, the tag is the tag you define when you create the Docker image. So that's up to you. Uh, the site domain host is just uh, here, this, uh, this address, dot for the same. Um, the public key, uh, so that's the uh, host name. The public key is available uh, if you go to uh, the account uh, user. And here you have the public key and the private key. So that's allow you to, uh, to uh, talk to a BioFlow server via the Python uh, API. So you can copy, paste there. Uh, check that it's the same here. And then the project ID is uh, the problem. Uh, basically, the problem ID is uh, the, the, what is the idea of the new problem you created. So this is this number here. You can grab it from the URL. So it's uh, this number. So we can copy, copy it. So my new command will be this one. I can try to run it. Uh, personally, uh, I didn't uh, install Docker in a way that I can run it with a simple user. So it's going And then you can press enter. So, what it does is that it's grab the images uh, and the uh, labels from the servers and then uh, check that everything is fine and then push them back and convert uh, the labels into annotation. So all those weird numbers here uh, show that the labels is now converted to a coordinate annotations. So now it's done. And if I go back to the website, ah, okay, so it immediately uh, refreshed. So now you have the, the annotation uh, display. Uh, on the original image. So that's the way to uh, to upload a new uh, problem with uh, the images. So depending of the category of the problem, you have different type of uh, uh, ground truth, as uh, Sebastian mentioned. Like uh, for example, it can be uh, SWC files if you uh, if you have a problem related to uh, uh, some uh, a filament tracing uh, can be different if uh, you do uh, set tracking, object tracking. 
But uh, yeah, that's it. all the format are supported with the tools to uh, re upload the annotation. So uh, it should work fine. So that's it for this part. So uh, I will just go a bit quickly because uh, I, it was a, a, a bit a bit longer than 15 minutes, but I guess it's okay. So for, to integrate your own workflow, like uh, you have written an analysis workflow yourself, or you have uh, found an open source workflow that you want would want to have in Bioflows, I will show you how to do this. So the prerequisites are that you need a GitHub account and Docker Hub account, and then uh, you need to configure Bioflows so that it uh, scans your GitHub repositories uh, and automatically uh, uh, imports the workflows uh, into Bioflows. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that GitHub can build, uh, uh, build the image and push it to Docker Hub, we need to give the uh, uh, access rights to GitHub. I will show you how to do this. And uh, yeah, your workflow needs, as uh, Sebastian uh, showed you, needs to do uh, some special things, work on all images in a folder, accept input parameters from the command line and produce a result in the ex expected form. Um, and then you have to adapt the four files uh, uh, about which we talked uh, multiple times already. And then you make a, a release on GitHub and that automatically builds the image, pushes it to Docker Hub. And since your Bioflow configured to look for these workflows, it will automatically import it. You just, uh, like Benjamin showed, you have still to uh, tell in which problems it will appear then. So that is everything on one slide. Now we look at this uh, afterwards a bit in the details. Here is once more the connection. So we have our GitHub repository with the four files. So, uh, when we build a release, an image is built, pushed to Docker Hub, Bioflow scans uh, GitHub for new uh, workflows. These report repositories should all begin with W underscore, so that Bioflow will not import uh, repositories so you don't want it to import that are not uh, Bioflow workflows. Yeah, and then when we ex when Bioflows executes the workflow in the web interface, it gets the image uh, from Docker Hub. Okay, so the uh, little example I made up here is to do 3D uh, spot detection and uh, just use a uh, transform and then find the maxima. Okay, so it has uh, parameters. Uh, first, there's okay, first the workflow. Uh, simple workflow, we clear the first and the last slides, which are the borders of the image. We do a median 3D filter uh, of the top head. We find the extended maxima, connected component analysis, and then we analyze regions and we get the coordinates of the centroids uh, uh, of the detections. That would be a workflow like you can write it or find it. Uh, and I will show you uh, afterwards what you have to do to integrate it. So here is how it looks like as an image J macro using morphology, basically. And here you see the results run with these parameters. Uh, it's hard to see if things are correct in these crowded 3D images. In 3D, you almost see nothing. And in the 2D, it's also hard because the center might be on another slide. So. Um, but of course we will have the metrics to see how well it performs afterwards. Okay, first thing you need uh, your, um, yeah, okay, you need your account on, uh, sorry, uh, I'm a bit, did I, up? okay. Yeah, you need your account on Docker Hub and it needs to match your account uh, on GitHub. So, um, one thing is that Docker Hub only allows letters and digits uh, in the in the account name, while GitHub uh, you can use other characters. Um, so if you have uh, yes, uh, minus signs in in the name on uh, uh, GitHub, they will they will be uh, removed. So like my uh, GitHub name is Volker minus Becker, and this will become Volker Becker in in Docker Hub, and that would still automatically be matched. 
Um, all this can also work with organizations which are present on GitHub and on Docker Hub. So it could be practically practical because then you have to do the connection only for organization and not for every repository. Um, yep. uh, okay, sorry, this is hidden here. Yeah, so if you don't have an account, you should create one on Docker Hub. Um, next step, we configure bioflows to scan your uh, GitHub repository. For this, you go to the Webflow tab, and uh, on the bottom of the page, you find Add New Trusted Source. There, you just fill in your username on GitHub and your username on Docker Hub. So now we can begin. We we can create a repository for our workflow on GitHub, and you don't have to start from scratch. You can uh, look for a similar one that already exists in the Nobias uh, uh, organization. And you have the create from template uh, possibility. So if you find one, like for me, the 3D spot detection, there's already one using image A. So I can just uh, use the template and then uh, add a new name. Um, actually, if you try this, this weekend, we have a little problem with the GitHub action. You shouldn't use the minuses in the repository name. Use underscores and everything will be fine, but I will fix this very soon. So you just enter a new name and first thing, you modify the readme so uh, that you don't confuse people who find this uh, with the wrong readme. So all the files from the other uh, repository are copied, but the two are not uh, uh, it's not a fork, so they're not connected in in this way. Uh, now um, this repository needs to be able to push things to Docker Hub, so uh, you need to create access token in Docker Hub. For this, you log into Docker Hub, you click on your username in the upper right corner, uh, you go to security, and there you can create a new access token. You just enter a name for the token and you can give uh, permissions. And now you copy this token and be careful because you can only do this once because it should remain secret. So you go back to your uh, GitHub repository and in the section, in the settings, you find secrets actions and there you create a, a secret with the name Docker Hub token and there you paste uh, that is a token that you acquired from Docker Hub. Um, and you need to create a second secret, which is your Docker Hub username. So this can also be done on the organization level instead of on each repository. Okay, now everything is set up, requirements are fulfilled, and we can start to adapt our macro for bioflows. Um, the results um, uh, we need uh, are is the mask of the centroid, so image where there is a point at each centroid. Um, it needs to accept parameters uh, and it needs to work batch mode on all the folders. So if you don't know what the accepted, expected result for the problem class is, you find all these in the uh, Bioflows documentation here at this link. Uh, in this case, it's a uh, 16-bit images where the points are 65,000 uh, and so on, and the background is zero. <clears throat> so our macro just uh, creates the, the coordinates of the centroid, so we add just some code uh, to draw these uh, pixels in, in, uh, in an image stack, which is then the uh, expected result. To read parameters from the command line. So here I have quite a lot of parameters. I shouldn't probably have exposed all of them to the interface. I could have fixed some. You also need input and output here, as we already said. And in an image J macro, that would just look like this. We have the get argument function, and then we split and pass it to get the values for the keywords. Yeah, and here is the part to make it run on all the images in the folder. We just add a loop 
and uh, uh, do our work on each image uh, in the folder. And then we need some cleanup so that we don't uh, uh, fill up the memory over time. And very important at the end, you need to uh, stop the Java virtual machine from running with the run quit command. Otherwise, uh, yeah, BioFlows will just uh, wait endlessly for this to, to end. Um, yeah, okay, we come now to the computational environment. So this is in the Docker file. So in this example, I thought, yeah, I would just have to install uh, the plugin I need, Waffle G. So from the template, I remove the plugins that were used there, and I add a line to install Morpholib G from the GitHub release of, of Morpholib G. But then I recognized that uh, it wasn't running with the quite old uh, Fiji version that was used in the template. So I also need to get a, a, a more recent Fiji version, which is just replacing here these, these three lines. Uh, and you can find those uh, on the Fiji archive. Okay, now we need to uh, tell the wrapper how to run the workflow. And the only thing we need to change here is, uh, is the parameters. So in our case of an image a macro, uh, this is how it is run. And here we have uh, the parameters and they are replaced by the actual values here. So we need to change this. And the descriptor, the JSON file, uh, we have to uh, use, yeah, we can put in a name which would, it will be displayed. We tell where the image is and a description that will be in the interface. Um, here again, we have to add the parameters. So this is why we want to create a wizard. So you don't have to put in the parameters and stuff uh, three times. Uh, um, yeah, it could be done automatically. Uh, um, and then for, for every parameter, you put in a default value, a description, uh, and the name. Okay, now we are ready. We're done. Uh, all you need to do is to create a release on GitHub now. So to do this, you click on tabs. There you find create a new release. And you should uh, put in a version number in this format, a V for version, and then the major, minor, and the, uh, uh, I don't know how you call the last one, but uh, the tech number or whatever. <clears throat> and yeah, then the GitHub action will uh, fire automatically. If you want to control what it is doing, you can click on actions and uh, look for this uh, last version that is built. And if there are any errors in this process, you can you can see what they are in the log of this, which you can access here. Okay, now I, I think uh, Benjamin al already showed this before to be able to access it finally in uh, um, bioflows you have to add it to a problem class um, so here we look for the spot counting 3d problem class uh, you click on configuration of workflows and then you enable it okay one thing i forgot because it has changed uh, the the polling for the new uh, GitHub repositories was actually not working so 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 great. So you have this uh, tab where you tell uh, BioFlows where to find uh, your your GitHub and Docker Hub, and on this uh, on this tab you can also uh, tell it to uh, look for it now, and that you should now also do. And yeah, then. We're done, and you already saw how it looks in the interface. Now, so now you can uh, run it in BioFlows, see how the uh, benchmarking goes, how it compares to the other solutions. And uh, if you know uh, a bit how to use Docker, you can also run it on your local machine for doing actual uh, analysis work. Um, and of course, uh, you could point in your publication to this. I mean, you should, uh, in addition to this, you should go to Zenodo or somewhere and uh, create a DUI for this. Uh, and then you could uh, point from there to the 
workflow in uh, from your publication to to this workflow so that the readers can directly go and and use it okay that was this part and uh, before we switch to future development uh, i have a small question you you say uh, that the token part uh, it's important to be to be careful because uh, uh, you can do it just once. What what do you do typically? You just uh, delete the repository and start from scratch, or what do you do to be? No, no. You, you, um, the, the thing is, <clears throat> if you lose your token, uh, you just can create a new one. That's no problem. But uh, if in Docker Hub you create the token, uh, um, you must copy and paste it like immediately because uh, you cannot go back to that special token you will not have access anymore after the creation but you can uh, just create another one well i just first wanted to make a, a quick comment on benchmarking as a whole like uh, in the field of uh, computer vision uh, because actually it, it predates uh, its use in uh, biomedical imaging and even more of uh, bioimage analysis now which is a, a newer field so in the field of computer vision Benchmarking is in the DNA, I would say, of researchers. And actually, it's, I think, almost impossible to publish without doing benchmarking. And the benchmarking is typically done on uh, some uh, reference uh, uh, databases, no image repository in, in the case of computer vision. So here I'm showing two of the most well-known and largest database, so ImageNet. There are really huge databases, and actually, uh, it's collaborative annotation. So uh, like it's only since internet become, became widespread that people could gather like such big databases, no? But for these problems, such as <clears throat> image classification in uh, thousands of classes, you really need like tens of thousands of annotation on images. So uh, it's very hard to do this uh, on your own or um, as a small group. So you, you, you really need to open this to the community, no? And uh, COCO uh, database is also a, a very large database in this case with a label of objects in, uh, in real images. So it's uh, different than only classifying uh, an image as a whole. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, uh, it's the only way to, to publish in this field uh, to compare your, your, your new algorithms or workflows to um, uh, other workflows that have been benchmarked on the same reference uh, uh, data sets. No? Uh, still, uh, in many cases, at least that was the case 10 years or 15 years back when I was doing uh, some uh, research in the field, uh, people were often re-implementing the workflows of other people. Uh, so uh, it was error prone and also time costly. So I think it's uh, very good to try to encourage this dockerization that we are trying to promote. I mean, us and, and many other projects now, like it's not that we are the only one, of course. Um, and, and the workflows, yes, were sometimes also very difficult to reuse by uh, uh, common people that were not so into uh, so much into programming because sometimes you had to compile them and it, you could spend days uh, just, just managing to make it run. So, so it's also something that is solved uh, with the uh, Docker approach. No? Uh, um, Michael already mentioned Grand Challenge, which is a sort of database of um, most of biomedical challenges so it's a very nice place uh, there are quite many challenges and data sets available but uh, even as of today the microscopy and the bioimage analysis part is tiny as compared to the uh, to the whole um, uh, challenges which are mostly like for biomedical so like uh, using medical imaging not so much uh, microscopy light microscopy and fluorescence microscopy so that's also why when we started with Bioflows, it was in 2015, I think, uh, we thought it would be good to have like our own place for bioimage analysis and mostly uh, light and EM microscopy images. Uh, there's another uh, very uh, known, uh, I think, place for uh, annotated data set and challenges, but it's, go, it's way wider than just uh, image analysis. In this case, it's Kaggle, and you can also find some uh, microscopy data set there. And there are five in the subclass computer vision. So like uh, really trying to analyze uh, uh, image features. Uh, so again, it's like a very low uh, representation of uh, microscopy images. Uh, I don't, 
intend to uh, put a grand challenge and bioflows face to face. They are meant for quite different things, even though there's uh, some overlap in the benchmarking and also possibly to use bioflows as for challenge organization. But basically, as I mentioned, low representation of biological microscopy data set in grand challenge as, as of today. Also, uh, the metrics used in the challenges for similar problem are not always the same. So uh, it's, it might be difficult to compare from challenge to challenge. And even though there is a, a clear trend of uh, asking com um, competitors to provide their workflows as uh, dockers, so they have their own API in this case in, uh, for the grand challenge, it's still about half of them only that are uh, available in such way as of today. And it was way less like a few years back uh, when we started. Uh, also, the algorithms are not directly linked to their source code. And most of the time, you have to re require, require some access to the author. So it's not as open as we intend to be, so to say. Uh, finally, on the image and annotation, remote visualization, I think Biaflows is way more flexible to visualize the results and also to visualize the metrics. Uh, you can see them per image or with different statistics. So uh, Grand Challenge is more like a, a leaderboard with the results, so it's a bit more fixed. But of course, I mean, as I said, there are two different platforms and Grand Challenge was designed uh, for challenges and nothing else, uh, whereas Bioflows can be used for uh, multiple use cases, as we have seen. In terms of uh, uh, so limitations and roadmaps, things we would like to improve. I mean, Bioflows is still a prototype. We don't have really any user community. It's very small. Um, and we still don't have that many data sets and they are mostly synthetic data sets. So essentially, we did this to prototype the system and make sure like everything works fine. Uh, but we would need to fill it with uh, more content and also especially like real images and, and human annotation. In terms of core features, we would like to uh, improve. Uh, we didn't go into these details, uh, but uh, as it is for now, we have a unique Docker for the workflow and also for the computation of the metric and uh, data preparation. So everything is in the same container. It's when we started the project, it was easier to do it this way. So we decided to go for this uh, solution, but uh, we noticed uh, that it was not the right way to do it uh, because you want to isolate the computation of the metrics and the workflow itself. So that if you do some updates on one part, it doesn't affect the other part and you don't have to recompile everything. So. Uh, we are working towards a more modular architecture where this would be isolated in uh, different dockers. And actually you could also chain workflows. Uh, so this is like a really core development. It's not that uh, straightforward. Uh, Cytomine team is also working in this uh, direction. So we hope to um, channel this to, to buy a flows and work together on this part in the, in the coming uh, months. Uh, we would also like to simplify the integration of uh, workflows, uh, possibly with a wizard from the user interface. And as Volker explained, automating some um, um, redundant uh, uh, information, such as um, the, the parameters of the workflow, so that it's automatically copied in the correct place in the files. And finally, we also had one idea of a generic workflow that could be used especially for object segmentation or detection uh, based on deep learning models that are coming from the BioImage Zoo, uh, which is a, a repository of uh, deep learning uh, models that you, you may know. So uh, we, we would like to have like a generic workflow that could directly fetch uh, new models for the same class of problem from the repository so that you, you don't even have to re-implement it once it's done. In terms of more exploitive features, uh, so yes, yeah, this uh, modular um, workflow architecture to be able to chain different workflows and have like flexible IO formats. Uh, it's quite complex, but it's uh, on the map. Uh, we would also like to work on um, automating the tiling uh, of large images. So when you have a very large image, if you use, for instance, a simple image macro, you might quickly bump into a memory limitation if um, your workflow has intermediary steps. So we would like to relieve this on the developer 
and have an option to automatically uh, break a large image into uh, smaller images, uh, batch process them uh, as it is now, so like as a folder of images, and then uh, recombine all the results for every independent image uh, to get the results for the large image. Uh, and finally, another idea is to also trigger multiple jobs uh, with different parameters to scan uh, the benchmark result uh, based or depending on this parameter. So it's a, a bit the same approach as this uh, uh, um, rock analysis that uh, Michael uh, shown. So where you trade off the specificity for 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 the uh, um, detection uh, rate, for instance. So these are the main, uh, yeah, the main features we we are uh, looking uh, to to improve in the in Bioflows. Uh, important to mention, this is the core developer team. So as I already mentioned, it's uh, mostly a site domain team and ourselves, and there's also uh, Lassie uh, uh, working uh, actively on the project, and we also have uh, many other contributors that. Mm, did some contribution to uh, some part of the code or or, or just like uh, giving giving us feedback so they are listed here and most of them or almost all of them are from uh, UBS uh, and these are their uh, respective institutions with that I'm finished uh, thanks for listening uh, you mentioned it, the the problem of managing a very large tile scan and your approach will be partition the, the image. So you you are conscious, you know, you'll miss probably uh, some of the cell and some of the object you are trying to segment. Um, and you you did say you are expecting to, to gain more from um, very big data set where you can count a lot of cells and doesn't matter if you if you lose objects on the edge, right? So, so I mean, the tiling, of course, is not, is not free. Uh, if you already sort of it, like you have different strategy, you typically need to have some overlap if you don't want to lose some information uh, at the border of the tiles, etc. So, initially, we we didn't want to go into this because uh, it's basically also connected to the uh, core development of the algorithm itself. I mean, uh, because if you do it wrong, you might actually induce some errors that are not really. Uh, due to some weakness of the algorithm itself, but just of the way you 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 combine the tiles, so to say. So it's something that that's also why it's only in the explorative uh, parts um, of what we would like to do, uh, because it's not straight or straightforward to have a generic and perfect solution for it. Okay, but if you design it correctly, um, you don't necessarily have to lose any kind of information no, no, not not necessarily i mean this is not connected to it um, we'd like to have this feature because um, not so much for the benchmarking part but if you want to use bioflows for your own image analysis solution and image management um, it's i think a very nice facility to have because you don't have to care so much then of how you design your algorithm in terms of uh, memory requirements. Uh, you can just do it working on small images and it should scale to large images. Um, so that's the, the intention. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you.